Hello, my name is Richard Cook, and I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about the marvelous resilience of bone and resilience engineering. Thanks very much for taking the time to be with us and look at this video and, and to talk about this very important subject. And I, my hope is that uh, at the end of this, you will have a discussion amongst yourselves in which you share different views about what this might mean for Cerner and the ways in which you could exploit these ideas to try and make both the company and its products more resilient by applying resilience engineering. Uh, I start out with a disclaimer. I'm not. I'm. I'm not presenting anything here that is, um, you know, a, a, a an off-label uh, use of any kind of medication or anything like that. And I appear only on behalf of myself, not a, a spokesperson for any other group. The title of this uh, talk is a few observations on the marvelous resilience of bone and resilience engineering. It's a simple talk about complex systems. I obviously am going to have to make a lot of stuff seem very, very trivial and, and brush over stuff. You'll forgive all that because we've got a couple of main points that we're trying to make. And you, you, if you want to go into the details, there's plenty of opportunities to do that later. One of the problems when we talk about resilience is that, that the word resilience isn't used consistently. And this leads into lots of problems. People end up talking past each other or uh, get confused because resilience is used in so many different ways that are not entirely compatible. The most uh, earliest kind of notion of resilience is durability, something that lasts for a long time. You think of the pyramids of Egypt as being resilient in the sense that they're there. But they're resilient in a very static sort of way. They just don't change. The fact that you can build something out of a big pile of stone that lasts for thousands of years is interesting, but it doesn't tie, tie in very well with the resilience notion that we think of in, in modern terms. A second way of thinking about it is, is resilience is a kind of recovery, almost like a spring kind of mechanism. You can deform something and then it will spring back to its original uh, dimensions. And that's an interesting idea because it's got some dynamic in it. Things change and the system responds and it comes back to it. And so people very often talk about resilience as being the, the restoration or recovery to a previous state. Of course, we don't live in a world where there is any sort of state. The world is changing and it's complex in ways, which means that we can never recover back to exactly where we were. So this little idea is it's also a bit limited. A much more modern and I think much more useful idea is that resilience is really about adaptability and about sustained adaptability, the ability to adapt over time as circumstances change. And this is a property mostly of living systems. And you, you'll like this picture of the tree which has grown around the fence. The, the, the tree's ability to adapt to the circumstances of its surroundings and still accomplish basic goals is, is very much tied to most of the modern notions of resilience. Now, I'm going to start with an assertion about bone, and this is a very strong assertion, but I'm going to make it anyhow. Bone is the archetype of resilience. Bone is the most comprehensive, most complete, and most useful example of resilience is around. If you hear the word resilience, you should think bone. Even more than that, if you hear the word resilience and it doesn't quite fit with your understanding of how bone works, then that term resilience is being used in a special way that may make it fairly weak or difficult to use in the broad sense. Resilience is in bone, it's part of bone, it's also part of a larger system, which is the organism, and that organism does have resilience. We're going to talk about bone specifically. One of the questions we want to ask, though, is, is if bone is the archetype of resilience, what is resilience engineering? What does it mean to engineer around or using or uh, affecting resilience? That's a pretty tough question to answer, and you're going to get a lot of people talking in various ways about that. I'm going to try and give you a clear idea about two kinds of resilience engineering, two, two different ideas that you can carry around with you and that connect very much to this bone idea. Now, the, the, the resilience itself has two hallmarks, I would say. That one is this graceful extensibility. Think about that tree for a moment and its ability to encounter the fence and then wrap around it, continue its vertical growth, 
become strong, fill out the trunk, become greater, uh, a full-grown tree, even in spite of that obstacle. The tree is able to extend its function and become what it needs to be, uh, but it does that uh, in a graceful way. It doesn't suddenly stop and say, well, I need a different tree and go off and order one from the store. It does it over time. It's also sustained. It's, it's an adaptation that doesn't, doesn't happen just once, but seems to be property of the underlying organism over a long period of time. And for most of us today who are trying to study this stuff, we would say that the hallmark of resilience is this quality of sustained adaptability. Now, I have to caution you right off of the bat that although this, these sound like very nice things, and they probably are, there are features of resilience that are quite difficult uh, for us to confront. The first is that it's expensive. Resilience requires continual energy and resource inputs. It's not something that you get just because you built something and it is now resilient. You have to continue to invest in it over time. You have to have continual energy and resource inputs. Another thing that people don't like is that resilience is vulnerable. It can be disrupted by a loss of feedback, and it's some in some cases susceptible to various kinds of diseases. We'll talk about this in, in the uh, bone case, um, but I would like you to think about this in the broader sense, because whenever you say you have resilience, you should also be thinking about the ways in which it's vulnerable. The third thing that's a limitation is that resilience uh, has a peak and then diminishes over time. Nothing is resilient forever. Even bone, human organisms, they die. And they are able to recreate themselves as other organisms, but every organism, every case of resilience that we know of has some temporally limited uh, features that, that mean that it is not forever. You can't build something that is resilient forever. You can only process through and try and build things that have sustained adaptability. Okay. Let's look at bone for a minute. One of the things that's most impressive about bone is that it's a continuous remodeling process. Although you may not know this, the adult human skeleton is completely replaced about every 10 years. All of the bones in your body are being constantly chewed up and, and then laid down in a continuous cycle. It's happening fairly slowly and quietly in the backdrop. So for your, in your experience, the bones of your body are kind of static things. You have you know, your, your humerus, your ulna, your radius in your arm, and those seem like they are always there. But in fact, in the background, a process is going on that constantly takes them away and recreates them over time. And that never stops. The interesting thing is that the reason that you have a sense that this thing is permanent and, and sort of static is because the tearing up of old bone and the laying down of new bone are in a dynamic balance that keeps these two in about equilibrium or sometimes adding a little bit during growth. And the result is that your experience of it is that this thing is kind of fixed, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. A third thing that is interesting here is that this remodeling is not just remodeling, um, you know, sort of willy nilly, but it's very much directed by mechanical strain. There are sensors in the bone that look at where the mechanical strain is that's being passed through the bone and then arrange to lay down new bone along those lines of strain. This is particularly important because bone is pretty hard stuff to make. It's fairly expensive energetically to do so, and we don't have a lot of calcium to use for it. There's another characteristic that's similar to the remodeling, which is repair. Well, we know that if you break a bone, that it will fix. It will be fixed. Your bone will grow back together. It will knit together. And this is really a form of, of the kind of remodeling, but with some extra mechanisms, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes. Another key feature of bone, and that's a feature also in general of resilient systems, is that it acts as a storehouse. It's used for multiple purposes. Bone is the primary storage in our body for calcium and phosphorus, two really critical minerals that we must have. And bone provides not only structural strength uh, and of the skeleton, but it also acts as a place that the body can call upon to gain to to activate calcium and bring it into the bloodstream, activate phosphorus and bring it into the bloodstream as needed. 
Now, all this is accomplished by signaling. And this is another characteristic we find in resilient systems is that there's a tremendous amount of crosstalk signaling communication going on in a network that constitutes bone. And this is what makes it all happen. The key factor in this is that there's no master controller. There's no place in the body that says, I want the bone to be made in this particular way. This is a true distributed system. It is distributed. And in fact, if you think about microservices and things like that, you would think about these as being, say, maybe nano services or pico services that are producing something that's useful. The signaling is not extraordinarily hierarchical. It's a messy layered network. It's got lots of crosstalk that happens both inside the cells and between cells and between parts of the body. It's quite a complex thing. And we'll talk a tiny bit about that, but very, very complicated. If you look at bone under a microscope, you're going to see something like this. On the left-hand side, you see a 10 magnification picture. It's a picture of, of bone. It's, bone typically has a, a thick, hard outer shell uh, that is called compact bone, and it has a kind of woven thing inside, little spicules of bone, it looks like a kind of a spongy thing called cancellous bone. If you take an even higher magnification, you see that there are tiny little canals in bone called Haversian canals that contain various, provide various nutrients and also contain various kinds of sensing mechanisms and allow crosstalk and so on to happen. So there's this very complicated layered architecture here, very much like you see in other distributed systems that allows bone to have the properties it has. This idea of continuous remodeling is a pretty novel one, and but it's a very important one. Bone is pretty expensive to make, and it's made out of calcium. We don't have very much of that. So to make the bone go where you need it and not where you don't is part of the whole deal. Bone is laid down where it can support the strains that you will experience. And that's why the shapes of bone and, and the shapes of the interior surfaces of bone are very much the same across individuals, even though they're not molecularly programmed. Nobody says, if you look at that picture in the upper left hand, the spicules of bone should go right here. There's no molecular signal that says that. But the regular processes of strain lead to the formation of this pattern. The pattern is emergent. By the way, there may be an optimal strain experience for producing the uh, strongest bone. And uh, that's something to think about if you're somebody who exercises a great deal. This remodeling at a microscopic level is really complicated. It's basically, as we said before, the laying down and absorbing of bone in a kind of balance. There are cells that, that lay down bone, secrete bone, those are called osteoblasts. And there are cells that chew up bone, those are called osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are little tiny cells that attach themselves like a limpet to a piece of bone and then secrete hydrochloric acid to dissolve the bone and allow the content of that to return to the circulation. Osteoblasts take that stuff and lay it down and, and allow it to mineralize on the surface of bone. And these two in a particular local area are generally in very, very uh, close balance. The other thing that you notice here is that there's lots and lots of signaling. There's both local modulation, depending upon local factors, and there's global modulation from endocrine sources within the body. The consequence of this continuous remodeling is that we can have fractures in a very microscopic way that are automatically repaired. We're, our skeletons are not strong because they are sort of impervious to damage. That's not true at all. They can easily be damaged. But these processes of laying down and chewing up bone are such that microfractures are detected, the strain patterns are, are identified, and there's repair going on continuously at a very, very constant pace. Part of the consequence of this ongoing thing is this is the mechanism by which we recycle calcium and phosphorus. This is the way in which calcium is returned to the body and, and phosphorus are returned to the body and also the way that calcium gets taken out and put down for bone. And so this kind of byproduct of this is that we're able to use this to, ma to manage the calcium we have. We only have about a kilogram of calcium of your roughly 70 kilogram body. Only one kilogram of that, about two pounds, is actually in the form of calcium. 
And calcium is a hugely important ion in the body. You would, if we took the calcium out of your body, you'd be dead in an instant. It's absolutely essential for every muscular contraction and every cellular function. It's the core, if you will, powerhouse uh, ion of the body. So maintaining calcium in the bloodstream is critically important to life. If you don't do that, you'll be dead almost instantly. This means that there's hormonal controls that cause calcium to be brought in from bone and uh, contributed to the circulation or put down in bone, taken from the circulation. There's also ways of absorbing calcium from the, uh, from the gut. These depend, by the way, on vitamin D. And there's way of ex ways of excreting calcium through the kidney. Uh, that's, by the way, one of the reasons why people sometimes get kidney stones. The signaling that's going on here is therefore both macro and micro. Again, feature of distributed systems that might uh, have a kind of resonance for you. This remodeling that's going on, this microscopic stuff, it's balanced, it's continuous, uh, it's energy consuming, uh, it takes a lot of energy to do it, and it's really complex. Over on the right here, I've got a list of a partial list of some of the things that researchers believe are signals that are passed between cells to, to control and balance the uptake of bone by osteoclasts and the laying down of it by osteoblasts. This is a pretty remarkable list. There's lots of stuff here, and I'm not gonna go into these in any detail, but the point here is that the signaling that's happening at a microscopic level is fiendishly complex. I'd like to draw one attention, uh, one one of these to your attention. It's PTHRP, the parathyroid hormone-related protein. This is one of the signals. We're going to come back to this in a little bit, but I just want to point out that just one of these signals is a possible therapeutic way of en uh, enhancing bone. Well, let's go to some real practical stuff. Uh, here's a radiograph of a uh, lower extremity, and uh, it's a picture that's of a 25-year-old male who reports that he, quote, kicked a lamppost in a fit of anger and later noticed he had, quote, difficulty walking, unquote. Uh, one suspects that alcohol may have been involved. Now, even those of you who are not radiographically trained may detect in this uh, picture some problem here. This uh, young man has uh, sustained a mid-shaft fracture of his tibia and that's what the problem is there that you see in the center. The tibia is the thicker bone, the fibula, one that you could actually do without, it doesn't do perform much function, but the tibia is the one that supports your, your leg from the knee down to the ankle. And this is clearly broken. So what do you do with somebody like this? Well, if you leave it alone, this thing will repair. If you break something, and you, most of you will know this, you'll have a period of time over which this thing is repaired. That period of time takes mm, maybe a year or a couple of years, but it starts out with the break itself causing a little bleeding at the site and a rupture of uh, the coating that goes around bones. And then over days and weeks that is replaced by cartilage that moves in there. And then over weeks to months, the cartilage is replaced by what's called a callus, which is bone, but a fairly disorganized, thick amount of bone. And then over years to a lifetime, that callus is remodeled and gradually uh, returns the bone to very much like its original shape. Any of you who have broken a bone and then had it uh, uh, knit together will remember that there was a period of time where you could feel under the skin the lump. Maybe it was your collarbone or your radius. You could feel a lump there, but over time that lump disappeared. That's the result of this process. The, the repair of bone is a process that involves modulation of the underlying remodeling process. Here's a picture from about four, uh, of a, of a, a uh, uh, anthropological dig from about 1400 AD. This is a picture of a 50 year old Chilean woman that's uh, taken from um, uh, Chile's uh, semi-arid north, uh, found in an excavation there by archaeologists. And you can see that what has happened to her at some point in the relatively distant past by, prior to her death is that she broke her femur. The circles show you that break. And what happened was the processes that normally repair bone were active in her, and they did knit this bone together into a solid piece. The femur is one piece. It's been brought back together again. 
Now, you will also notice that it's a very rough healing. It's a big, disorganized, fairly gnarly looking piece of bone that's brought it back together. And also that this leg with, that was broken is now going to be something like an inch and a half, maybe, or an inch shorter than the one uh, that was unbroken. She, she would have walked with a terrible limp if she walked at all. But the repair process happened here. This repair takes years to complete all the way. And so she had that time. She broke this, but then continued to survive until this thing was fixed. Why don't we have that problem today? Well, we understand that the underlying repair mechanism that is present in bone will knit broken pieces together, at least in the relatively healthy person. If we could get those pieces into the right alignment, then we should be able to get those things to heal in a functional way, and that's what we do. If you break your radius, as the person in this picture has done, you'll go in, you'll have the fracture reduced, that is, they will pull the bones apart so that the ends are aligned, and they will keep them stationary by putting a cast around it so that it's held in uh, position together uh, for long enough time for the healing to take place. The key idea here is that mechanical stabilization is what allows the normal processes of healing to give us a functional result in the end. The reason your arm is workable after you break your radius is because you have been uh, have been held in a good position, a functional position, long enough for the healing to take place. And so mechanical stabilization is a big deal, and that's what orthopedic surgeons do, right? There's a variety of ways of doing this. There's external fixation where you, you essentially realign the ends of the bone, and then you uh, put uh, screws through the skin and into the bone and have a kind of trapeze arrangement to hold it. Or you have internal fixation and open reduction uh, where you uh, take and do something to put things together. You might put a plate together, open the skin and put a plate down there. Or as you see in the radiograph on the right, uh, you could have what's called an intramedullary nail. In this case, what happens is that this person has had a, a, a fracture of their uh, mid-shaft femur uh, on the right-hand side. And they've been uh, taken into the operating room, put in traction to allow those two ends to be uh, properly aligned, and then held in traction. The orthopedic surgeon has taken that thing that looks white, but is in fact a piece of titanium, and uh, with a big hammer, drove it from above the femur all the way down until it crossed that point and reached down well towards the knee, and then stuck a little pin in and hammered that in from the side uh, in order to hold it in place. Uh, you can see why I chose to be an anesthesiologist. These things can only be done uh, with adequate anesthesia. It's a pretty simple idea, though. You understand that the idea of the surgeon is I need to get these two pieces aligned and then keep them in that alignment for long enough for the healing to take place. This is a fairly old idea. Uh, if you go back to ancient Egypt, um, probably somewhere around 1600 BC, you'll find uh, that some of the tombs of the ancient pharaohs contained in them what look to us today to be splints. That is, they are things that were applied to broken bones to hold them in, a, in alignment so that the bones would heal together and the result would be functional. The first medical textbook, which is known as the Edmund Smith Papyrus, because Smith was the person who discovered it, this is from around 1600 years uh, before the current era, uh, refers specifically to this. Uh, here is the um, actual uh, portion of that transcribed. Uh, on the left, you see the hieroglyphics, and on the right, for those of you whose hieroglyphics are not entirely uh, current and, and fluid, I, I have uh, provided the text. Um, here's what we do for somebody who has a, uh, a broken upper arm. You should have placed him prostrate on his back with something folded between his two shoulder blades. I should have spread out with his two shoulders in order to stretch apart his upper arm until that break falls into place. This is what we would call today a reduction. Thou shouldest make for him two splints of linen, and thou shouldest apply for him one of them both on the inside of his arm and the other of them both on the underside of his arm. 
Thou shouldest bind it with, and this is a word is difficult to translate, it's Yermu. I believe this is, Yermu is the word for plaster of Paris, but Paris hadn't been invented yet, and treat it afterwards with honey every day until he recovers. This is very sound medical advice, by the way. This works. And in fact, there were a group of people who were known as bone setters in ancient Egypt who did these things for people who had broken bones and got good results for it. By the way, this uh, papyrus was translated in uh, about the 19, uh, uh, late 1900, early 1900s. Uh, and, and so we've had this evidence that this is a very ancient technique for quite a long time. But I want to ask you, isn't this kind of resilience engineering? Aren't we taking the engineering and applying it to a resilient system? We, there is resilience here. Bones will heal. That's part of the natural process. But to get the functional result, what we want to have happen, to have a limb that will be able to support the, the weight and be functional in this way, we need to create conditions so that resilience will play out along the right lines. This requires understanding how resilience plays out. That is, we have to understand that there's this healing period, that we have to hold uh, things in this position for a certain long uh, period of time and so forth. We didn't need to understand in detail the mechanisms of the resilience that are involved by the ancient Egyptians had no idea about osteoclasts and osteoblasts and signaling and all the rest of that stuff. But they did benefit from knowing what modulates resilience. For instance, we've known for a long time that good nutrition is cru crucial to healing bone, and that's largely because you need energy and calcium to interact uh, with all of those repair mechanisms. But there is this thing that is this resilience engineering, if you will, which is not changing resilience as much as controlling or trying to influence the way that resilience plays out. We know the resilience is there. Our goal is to be able to tap that resilience in such a way that the way it plays out over time will be beneficial. It's a great idea and we love this, but as you know, life isn't all beer and Skittles. There are problems with this resilience as well, and I want to talk to you about a few of those problems just to remind you, put a little caution, that resilience isn't always easy and it's vulnerable in some ways. We have a bunch of different diseases of bone. Osteogenesis imperfecta may be one that some of you have heard of. Here you don't actually mineralize the bone, it stays almost rubbery. These patients do very, very poorly. Um, and they are in extremely um, uh, vulnerable. Uh, there's another called Paget's disease where you're, uh, the activity of, of chewing up and laying down is, is sort of hyperactive and as a consequence leads to this mothy pattern that you see in the skull picture on the right. There's osteoporosis, which is something that we almost all know about, which is a, a worsening of the strength of bone because of loss of its internal structure and strength. There are cancers of bone like osteosarcoma, which is a terrible disease and which is where this mechanism of making bones somehow loses its internal uh, molecular controls and runs riot until the patient uh, very often succumbs. We see the consequences of nutritional problems. There's a disease called Ricketts disease, which is known uh, for the vitamins D deficiency. And these children have this bow leg appearance that you would associate with that. And there's a thing called hyperparathyroidism. You can have problems where your parathyroid is always demanding more calcium and actually uh, it does it in, an, in a, a sort of an autonomous way. It's a bit as though you had a microservice that was no longer listening to any of the signals that were coming about how it should behave and simply took over every virtual machine and started running all of the uh, processes uh, became that microservice. In this case, the hyperparathyroid uh, sends out an enormous uh, signal saying, give me more calcium, and the bone is chewed up in order to create very high levels of calcium, which then is excreted through the kidney. If you end up with kidney stones, by the way, somebody will check you to see if you have hyperparathyroidism when you first appear with the doctor. But the idea here is that resilience isn't free and it's not perfect. It's vulnerable in a variety of ways. So we have to understand that we expect to be engineering around it. Let me talk about one of these conditions in a little more detail, osteoporosis. It's a really important condition, one that we should pay attention to. It's a major cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States and other advanced countries where we have lots of elderly people. It's a major cause of disease in women. As you see on the right, it turns out that women are 
are uh, probably more affected by this disease than men are for a variety of interesting reasons. Um, but the problem here is that, as you can see in the pictures on the left, uh, that there is something happening that causes the bone itself to become thin and the total amount of calcium that is there to decrease. On the left-hand side, you see a young adult, and on the right-hand side, you see uh, the ver vertebral body of, a, of a, an elderly adult that's osteoporotic, and there's no doubt which of these is the strong one and which is the weak one. This is a hugely important disease, and many of you will have an elderly relative or someone that you know who has broken a hip or something like that as a result of being um, osteoporotic and then had all of the many serious consequences that follow from that. Now, the osteoporosis apparently, and although this is hard to say with, uh, with certainty, but apparently what's going on in osteoporosis is that there's some breakdown in the signaling or the functioning about the balance between laying down new bone and chewing up old bone, that balance is shifted in the favor of the chewing up part. There's not enough of the osteoblast activity and too much of the osteoclast activity. So with that balance altered in favor of chewing up bone, the bone gradually becomes thinner and loses its strength. Understanding this, that, that it's a, something about the either the low osteoblast activity or the high osteoclast activity, but something in the balance is one of the ways in which people have been able to discover new kinds of therapies for this. And there are basically two client classes or kinds of therapies directed at treating uh, and, and preventing the consequences of osteoporosis. One of these is, is to reduce the osteoclast activity. And that is uh, done with bisphosphonates, uh, with uh, calcitonin, uh, estrogen has been used for times, particularly in postmenopausal women. But the whole point of this is to try and get the osteoclast to be a little less aggressive in chewing up what's going on so that the osteoblasts get a little head start on them and we can keep or increase the thickness of bone and the, and the mass of bone. More recently, there's been a development that looks at um, the parathyroid, um, parathyroid, excuse me, related hormone, and and actually tries to mimic that. Born bone formation by osteoblasts can be stimulated by a new class of drugs, uh, and the uh, the model for this is a drug called abiloparatide. That. Abiloparatide is actually a synthetic analog of PTHRP, which you will recall is one of those signaling things from before, right? We pointed out one of these signals and understanding that PTHRP is a signal and modulating it by giving some of this abiloparatide, its uh, molecular structure is here on the right, is an attempt to increase the osteoblastic activity so that there's more osteoblast work going on and the bone thickness is increased because the balance has been and redressed. There are a couple of these drugs that are now on the market, abiloparatide, teriparatide. Um, you'll find them being used fairly frequently. These proteins are are only available because of the research that looked at understanding how bones resilience functions at a very deep molecular level. This is something that's only happened in the past decade and these drugs have only been available for a relatively short time. They work, there's no doubt about it. Abloperatide has significantly reduced the incidence of vertebral fractures compared with a placebo. 91%, that's a great number. Let me tell you, if you can make a drug and you get a 91% reduction, that's a big deal. It works directly by um, trying to modulate resilience to restore something that was sort of fading as our lives uh, were extended and we became elderly. And it's a great invention, a really wonderful example of how to increase resilience itself rather than simply allow resilience to play out along its own uh, lines so that we get a functional result. I don't want to go overboard on praising drugs like abloperatide. It's still not all Skittles and beer. Abloperatide in high doses causes some bony tumors in, in rats. And so it may have various kinds of other problems. And by the way, 
the way that the osteoblasts lay down bone is not always the most efficient. There's a variety of ways in which this may not be a perfect mechanism. But the point here is that people, through understanding the details of resilience, have been able to come up with novel therapies. In particular, what's significant about this is that they're using microgram amounts of abloperatide, so small that you could hardly see it, and having this large effect. They're getting in and working with that signaling stuff. If you think about it, it's like trying to get in and work with the actual messaging that's going on in parts of the distributed system that you are running. This is a second kind of resilience engineering. It acts on resilience mechanisms directly, and it depends very much on a deep understanding of resilience that has only developed fairly recently. It sustains the adaptive capacity of the organism past what it would normally have been, but it also generates new types of hazard, and we should be aware of that and thoughtful about that as we go forward. So what I'd like to suggest to you, uh, close to being done now, is, is is that there are two kinds of resilience engineering. One that's about 3,500 years old. That's engineering that's applied to an, a resilient system. It depends upon the resilience that's already present there, and it relies with an understanding how resilience plays out. It's a way of getting the resilience uh, to be used to our benefit. I'm going to tell you that orthopedic surgeons are resilience engineers, first and foremost, although they won't say that. The next time you talk to an orthopedic surgeon, say, oh, you're a resilience engineer, they'll be very impressed. The idea is that they are resilience engineers because they know about the resilience of the body and they are, are very alert to what is necessary to exploit the resilience of bone in order to achieve a good result. The second kind of resilience engineering is about five years old in this particular area. It acts directly on the mechanisms of resilience. Here we're playing with the signaling itself. It depends deeply on a very nuanced understanding of that stuff. It helps sustain adaptive capacity, but it also generates new types of hazard. Geriatricians who are giving abloperatide are also resilience engineers. In a larger sense, physicians, nurses, people in the medical profession are mostly resilience engineers. None of us heal. We only set up conditions in which the body can heal. The body heals itself and we try and coax that along, direct it in certain ways and so on, but we're not the healers. That's the wrong word. We're engineers. We're resilience engineers who through our understanding of resilience, are able to allow the result to be a good one. No surgeon heals. Every surgeon is a resilience engineer. Are there other examples of resilience engineering in, in, in medicine and elsewhere? Yeah, I think there are lots of them. And I will give you one of the most important is vaccines. What is a vaccine but a way of triggering the body's own resilience mechanisms to be able to say, I've seen this before and I know what to do with it. This is a very subtle kind of resilience engineering, but it is really about the resilience of the body. We're telling the immune system about the shape of something that is likely or possibly unlikely to see in the future so that it is prepared to launch a, a defense against that when that happens. Very nice example of that, very deep resilience engineering. And we are becoming much better at this. We've got a transition from sort of very limited understanding of vaccines to now what is an extraordinarily sophisticated one, as many of you have recognized over the past few months. Okay, well, coming to the close here. Bone reminds us that resilience requires energy and resources. Resilience has its own set of pathologies and is vulnerable, and that resilience is easier to use than to make. Frankly, it's a lot easier to exploit resilience than it is to make new resilience. Harnessing and enhancing the resilience of bone are two kinds of what we call resilience engineering. These are critical notions for me, and I hope that you've been able to see a distinction between these two types of resilience engineering. One, where we use a res uh, understand a resilient system, and we use that understanding to shape the way it is going to play out in the future to get a good result. And the other, where we are actually trying to alter the resilience directly. 
It's a very hard thing to fix, to, to alter that resilience. You have to know an enormous amount about the system in order to be able to do that. My hope is that when you hear resilience, the word bone will come to mind. You should remember that bone is the archetype of resilience. If you hear someone talking about resilience or talking about resilience engineering, saying their system is resilient, saying that the, the approach is a good resilient engineering approach, in the back of your mind, you should be saying, okay, tell me how this is like bone. Is this really like bone? Is there a remodeling, a repairing mechanism? It is constantly being restored and replenished. It does it require continuous inputs of energy and are those present? Use this idea about bone and resilience as a way of critically interrogating the ideas that come across when you hear people uh, promoting resilience as a thing in, in the organization and elsewhere. I also hope that you'll use this as an opportunity to talk with your colleagues. I know that Cerner is remarkable for a combination of both clinical people and uh, uh, tech people, particularly software people. This is where the action is right now. And the communications between you is really crucial. And I offer you this idea about bone and resilience and resilience engineering is the starting place for discussions between uh, your nurses and physicians and the tech people about what's going on. I hope that those of you in the software world in particular will be looking for places where you can see how brittle or problematic various parts of the system are and think about how much the people and the organization that is able to change and adapt and modulate the software and make the systems run reflects a kind of resilience that is present in the organization and makes the company more resilient. I want to thank you very much for your attention, your time. I would have liked to have done this in person, but I'm also very happy that you have this as a recording. You'll be able to look at this again. There's a recording going to be available, and I will make all of the slides available to you as a PDF handout. If you want to go back and look at the individual slides, please do. I hope that you found it useful to think about the marvelous resilience of bone. Thank you very much.